So I'm going to talk about the uh, use of nickel resin fluorescence for achieving zero knowledge uh, warhead uh, verification. Um, you know, I'll skip the overview um, very quickly because we don't have too much time. So what's what's the problem that we're dealing with, right? And what has been what prior work has already been done to address this issue? So currently, you know, we are under the New Start Treaty, which was signed in the United States about four years ago, and it uh, the, the the purpose of the, of the treaty is to reduce the stockpiles uh, to something like 1,500 warheads each. It's about a factor of three reduction compared to the previous treaty. So the question is, you know, you know, treaty partners sign a treaty, and then how do they verify that this 1,500 warhead is actually the case? So actually they do not, right? They don't target the warheads uh, themselves. Uh, what they do is that they verify or try to verify the number of delivery vehicles. Because number of building vehicles in principle is a good proxy for the uh, strike capability because strike capability of their opponent. Right? So if you have, I don't know, enough delivery vehicles to launch 1,500 warheads, if you have 10,000 warheads in the bunkers, who cares in principle, right? From the in the context of a nuclear war, right? Um, so why delivery vehicles? Because they are easier uh, to, to verify. A delivery vehicle means bomber aircraft, ICBM, submarine launched uh, ballistic missiles, etc., etc. The trouble with this is that uh, this is not such a bad proxy uh, for you know for the nuclear capability of the two countries. Um, however, the trouble is that if there's a, you know there's a large leftover of you know non-deployed warheads, meaning that warheads of the same type that are could be kept in bunkers, you know, um, you know, as stairs, uh, so to speak. The trouble is that there's you know risk of theft, uh, which can lead to nuclear terrorism, uh, as well as nuclear proliferation, right? And also, as another problem, is a rapid, you know, uh, rearmament in times of political crisis. So, you know, disarmament, instability, because you know, it would uh, essentially uh, there is a political crisis. The two countries would quickly build up their fleets of delivery vehicles, which is a lot easier to do than actually build new uh, new weapons. So, the question is, for future treaties, as far as future treaties are concerned, can we come up with ways to actually specifically count warheads rather than delivery vehicles? Okay. And of course, we do that. We have to do that without revealing any classified information. Other people would just not agree to that. So, what previous you know people have tried to do this uh, through information barrier systems, which essentially rely on attribute verification, so attributes of weapons. Uh, most of the work was done at the national laboratories, as well as the atomic weapons establishment, as well as a number of institutions in Europe, um, and they essentially try to verify some attributes of the weapon within some pretty broad range. For example, is the amount of plutonium more than half a kilogram? Is there uh, the, the concentration of plutonium 240 less than some amount <coughs> to distinguish between weapons grade and reactive grade plutonium? Is there a uh, high explosive pressure, etc., etc.? And of course, this criteria have to be pretty broad, otherwise, you will find out you know, some precise information about the weapon, which is not a lot. So here's a little cartoon, you know, you have a you know, black box and there's like a bunny, you want to find out, is there really a bunny? So you check, there's a curtain, which is the information there, and it tells you, has it long ears? Yes. Has it big feet? Yes. Has it a furry tail? Yes. So it must be a bunny, right? <laughs> so, now, the, the, the problem is that, the problem is that, so, so this is a picture of my dog, right? So <laughs> it has long ears, okay? Because it's a hound mix, okay? It has big feet, okay? And this is a beautiful furry tail. <laughs> so, so this type of uh, verification would not be able to distinguish between a bunny and my dog. Yeah, that's the problem, right? So what you could do is that you say, ah, but can we get the DNA of the rabbit? Okay. Yes, we could. We could verify that it's a bunny. Problems that from DNA, we find out its color. You know, we find out classified information: its color, its weight, its neutral multiplication. Right. Um, so the problem is that you know this essentially by you know because you are trying to make this criteria very broad. By the same token, this wide uh, criteria make it uh, vulnerable for to to diversions and to spoofing. Okay. Also, these information barriers are primarily in electronic. You are done through electronic devices, which allow the possibility of like backdoor, uh, you know, exploits, hacks, etc. So then there's also a risk of information leakage in addition to that. Okay. So an alternative approach towards this is rather to do attribute verification to do template verification, okay? which has its own pro difficulties, uh, but it allows for more rigorous checks. So the notion with the template verification is that you get hold of like a golden copy of a weapon. So how do you do that? There's different uh, things that people have proposed. One way is that inspectors arrive to a country, they come to like a random um, ICBM location, and they take a warhead off of an ICBM. Okay. So at that point, they're pretty sure that the warhead is real. Because in order for a country to have a nuclear deterrence, they need to have real weapons on real ICBMs. Okay. 
Um, so now that you have this golden copy, now what you do is that you have candidate copies, you know, that now you can do a comparison. Okay? And comparison fundamentally is a simpler thing to do than uh, you know, dead reckoning, absolute measurement type of uh, uh, verification. Okay? So you take your A0, you compare it to A1, are they the same? Yes, so it must be the real. If A0 is real, then A1 is real. If A0 is real, then A2 is real, etc. And then you send them, send them to dismantlement and you count them towards that country's obligations under the, uh, under the tree. Now the challenge is, okay, you know, how do you do this check, like this check over here, how do you do this without finding classified information, without allowing hoaxes to go through, etc. Et so this is the basic principle of the general paradigm of what we're working on. This is also described what the Princeton group is working on. Essentially the main difference between what they, what Princeton group works on, what we work on is this check over here. How do we do this actual comparison? Yeah, that can be quite difficult to do. All right, so a couple of things about our, uh, our uh, team, uh, MIT. So there's like three faculty, myself, Scott Kemp, uh, Dick Lanza. You guys know myself and uh, Dick Lanza. I also know both Scott Kemp. Scott is primarily responsible for the mathematics of the repair formation theory, as well as the geometric tomography aspects of the, of the verification. <coughs> we have a research scientist, uh, Barry Osmanov, who is responsible for experimentation. And we have three students. One of them studies the history, uh, does you know, policy research, the history of disarmament treaties, etc., various type of things that people have to go through. Uh, Rory is responsible for the information theory work, and Jason does primarily the physics aspects of the, of the work. Okay. So what is zero knowledge proof? Right? We keep using this word zero knowledge, zero knowledge. Well, what is that? So the, the zero knowledge actually proof is something that was developed in information theory in the 80s by Mikali and Goldwasser, actually at MIT, for which they got the Turing Award. And essentially, it's a, it's a way to uh, verify, to prove a theorem without disclosing any additional information. Okay. And it's heavily used in various kind of authentication protocols, you know, in, in various kind of you know, in computational systems, as well as other type of a physical system. Uh, but basically, it comes down to like a binary information. It tells you either yes or no. And it tells you nothing else about, about the question that you're asking. So the three requirements are soundness and completeness, which basically can think of as type one and type two errors. And the third one, which makes it zero knowledge, is that it requires that if the prover is honest, okay, then the verifier will learn nothing additional. So if the host country that is presenting weapons is doing the honest job, the verifiers will learn, the inspectors will learn nothing about those weapons. If they try to cheat, then all the bets are wrong. So just a kind of quick intuitive kind of thing of what could be a zero knowledge, an example, mental kind of exercise, what, in, what the zero knowledge would be. This is actually a kind of example that was brought up, coined by Scott Kemp. So you know, you're walking down, you know, into this like alpine mid meadows and with your friend, and you see like a pine tree. And your friend tells you, you know, I have a way to count every single pine needle on this tree. But the number of the pine needles is classified, and the way I do is classified. But believe me, I know how to. So they are telling us, okay, well, how could they check this without finding out anything else? So they tell us, okay, here's what we do. Uh, tell them, count number of the pine needles on the tree. So the person counts them. Then you go and you grab a bunch of pine needles from the tree, hide it behind your, you know, your back, and say, count it again. Tell me how much I took. So if they know how to do what they're doing, they'll count, they'll say, ah, there's six missing. Then you open your hand and you count one, two, three, four, five, six. If what they said was their count match, then you know that probably they are doing it. You know, they know how to do it. In the process, you found out nothing how they do it. You found out nothing about number of time goals on the other So this is like an kind of intuitive example of what is a zero knowledge test. Okay. So uh, now the real problem is that we don't deal with pine needles, we deal with weapons. So how do we do this? Okay. How to verify that weapon A and B are identical without finding out additional information? So what we so that it comes down to what kind of physical processes there are that have elements of zero knowledge built in, and what we use is transmission nuclear resonance fluorescence. Um, so I'm going to skip about a discussion about NRF, but essentially NRF is a nuclear equivalent of optical fluorescence. You have got the nucleus with you know, energy states, so you can decide to various states and get gammas corresponding to those uh, to those energy levels. So if you take a branch on okay, and you shoot it through your weapon A of the detector. At the far end, you put some kind of a foil, what's called a reference foil in the, in the technique. You'll get some kind of a spectrum in your detector, which can only see gammas from the foil itself, nothing else. Okay? And you'll see a couple of NRF peaks here and there. I'm not sure how well it looks over there. 
Now, the important thing is that number of counts inside this piece is a convolution of the weapon density and the foil, because the weapon works like a filter, and the foil works like an analyzer. Okay. So, given the particular number of counts in a peak, okay, that can be achieved either having by some density inside the weapon and the foil, or some other combination. So it's impossible for this single measurement to find out individually the density of the weapon or the foil. Okay. So then what you do is you switch the weapons, okay, you keep the foil in its place, okay, and you get another spectrum, and then you do a spectral comparison, and just sort of are the spectra the same. If the spectra are the same, if the foil will never move from its place, then the weapons can be the same as well. In a way, this is kind of like the computational equivalent is an MD5 sum that you can do on two files. If the MD5 sum hashes match, then the files must be the same thing. However, from the MD5 sum, you can never recover the file of them. Uh, so what's this convolution I'm talking about? You know, in reality, you can actually, to first order, you can calculate it analytically. Okay? It comes down to a couple of interesting parameters. The first one is the incident spectrum, which you do not know and can be kept constant. The second one is the device thickness, okay, which you do not know and has to be protected and verified. And finally, the foil thickness. Okay? And essentially, what you get is one equation with multiple unknowns. So you cannot reconstruct the unknowns. So essentially, D here is the quantity that needs to be protected and verified, and the epsilon phi and x are the like scrambling parameters. Essentially, this whole thing works like a one-time path. Effectively, right? Another thing that is important to understand: everything over here is classified by the host, and everything here is open. Foil is also classified. The host makes a foil. Okay? So first question is like, why? What if they put a piece of iron in there? Well, what you can do is that you can come up with a like, the, the spectral cell sums are self, uh, self validating You can say that you can just make the foil from whatever you want, but I better see NRF lines with some statistical significance of 10 sigma, whatever, for a particular list of isotopes of interest that we agree upon. Okay. And how they do it is their business. So just a couple of things about experimental resources, uh, laboratory for security and policy. Actually, I should have, I should have said that. You know, we're essentially a group uh, which consists of three faculty. Uh, so uh, we have about four hybrid remaining detectors that we have actually loaned from Pascal Systems, my previous employer. Uh, so are 100% and 85% detectors. We have acquired four new Cooler X compressors for Mortec for pulling the, uh, pulling the detectors. We're using Kane data position electronics for operating these detectors. Um, and uh, we have gotten a newly completed, like the renovation was finished like about a week ago, a newly renovated lab space about 1,800 square feet from the, from the department. Um, so this is for like essentially we use the space for testing the detectors, you know, checking different things with them, making sure that they work, and then we move it to uh, to an accelerator facility down the street. Uh, so there's a essentially a Bonde, Bonde a machine, three MeV um, electrostatic you know, DC accelerator, which can produce beams up to 100 microamps, and we have so you, know, you accelerate the electrons down, uh, and we have a magnet bending magnet, and we have a radiator. Uh, gold copper radiator. And uh, at this point, we end up getting our bread shown beam. Uh, we can put our weapon, weapon, you know, some kind of proxy, and, um, and and the foil. And then we have a well, we have good shielding for detectors, so detectors can only measure the, uh, the gamma scope of the foil. And actually, the original measurements of transmission NRF were done at exactly this facility, which helped a lot, because there's already an existing infrastructure to do this work. So there's other facilities that we may have to access. One of them is UC Santa Barbara, which has a 5.5 MeV palatron. It's a lot more stable than this extremely old Vandergraaff accelerator. This machine is like, it's incredibly old over I mean, the, the control electronics is, it's not electronics, it uses vacuum tubes. The first time I've seen vacuum tube being used to operate anything since 1986, when we used to have a TV back in the Soviet Union that was using vacuum tubes. Uh, but, it, but it works. It, it works. Uh, so it, it, it is a useful thing. There's a possibility that we might be able to acquire this very hypothetical 3 MeV superconducting LINAC. In fact, uh, today we're going to talk to a company in, in, uh, in Lansing that is developing this. So that would be extremely useful for doing these experiments. All right. So, you know, before lots of the work that we're doing in principle can be simulated. It's a physics in stone. There's a lot you can do by simulation rather than experimentation. You have to do both in principle. But there's a lot of kind of you can get just running simulations. But in order to do that, you need to you know code up your simulation and you have to you know benchmark it. You have to validate it. 
So we have taken an existing Jan4 class, module G4 and RF, which was developed PNNL many years ago. We have done lots of debugging on it, have done basic kind of uh, checks on that. And we, uh, the purpose is to, the goal, first of all, is before using it, we have benchmarking against uh, data. Um, uh, in order to in order to do this, uh, we essentially have you know we try to break down the whole process. The first thing is to see can we even reproduce the the, the branch uh, process. So we have done dedicated measurements for branch along. This is a, a sort of spectral shape comparison, saying showing that at least about 400 kV things match very well. We know what's going on the lower energy is backscattered from the wall, and then we increase the threshold to avoid the dead time. So we can do absolute measurements. We can see about 20% of the river. We know why we have this 20% it's because of our measurement of the beam current is not very precise. Nevertheless, for what we're doing, this is, this is good enough. Computational resources, uh, we, you know, we're doing lots of you know, simulations for that rather than using a physical, I won't go into details, but rather than using a physical cluster, we're using Amazon uh, Web Services, an EC2 uh, facility, which works out to be a lot cheaper and a lot easier for a number of reasons than actually a physical cluster. One of the things is that you don't have to spend $300,000 to buy a giant. Uh, cluster, you simply pay sixty dollars an hour to, to do that. Um, so a couple of like just a couple of very preliminary examples of Gen four simulations, like this is brutal from a couple of days ago. So we are simulating a simple geo uh, geometry that we call black sea design, which is actually this, this information from the black sea experiment on the which was done on the primary of a, of a Soviet thermonuclear uh, weapon. Okay, so essentially, we have a foil, which is a combination of uranium and plutonium. Um, and we want to look at essentially the NRF signatures, the NRF spectra from the foil, which is made out of well, uranium and uh, of uranium and plutonium. And we want to investigate three types of hoaxes. One of them is, if we take weapons grade plutonium, we replace it with reactive grade plutonium. Will we see a difference? So that means changing the ratios to plutonium to 39 and plutonium to 40. Uh, can we see weapons break the weather plutonium mass diver divergence? So finally, that one is geometric forces. Can we can we detect those? So we run you know gammas, something like 50 times 10 to the ninth gammas, which take about 1,000 core hours to get enough statistics. And to look get, uh, look at gammas coming off of the foil, so you know, secondary NRF gammas. And this is what we see. So this you know this, for people who have worked with you know, with NRF, this is very the usual spectrum. So the edge point was a 2.5 mm from the branch problem, and these are various NRF, various NRF lines for uranium to 38 to 35, to 39, and 24. This is all simulation. Uh, and then what we do eventually, and the other thing is that the lower energies over here, you have the EC3D continuum. This is actual trademark uh, quantity, um, uh, trademark uh, uh, te te uh, technique, which is using all this. Uh, using this continuum to reconstruct uh, the Z. And you really have to choose, choose your endpoint very well, otherwise a huge amount of counts of background will completely draw your NRF uh, sequel. So then what we do is that we swap uh, plutonium with grain to 38, okay? and we get another spectrum and then we compare them to each other. Can we actually see a difference? So in this case, we did see a slight difference, but except everything else was the same. And we found out that actually we had done it completely wrongly, that lots of the photos were completely missing the warhead. So we're just doing primary NRF. So it's very preliminary stuff, just to give an idea as to how we're exactly going to do this comparison. Okay? But again, the, the spectra does not exactly show the like the significant result. But so just the the uh, framework of how we're going to do this uh, comparison. All right. Something that's also important when you're working on this is uh, you know you have to realize that NRF is a great way to measure essentially material compositions, but it's not a way to measure the actual geometries because it comes down to a single pixel camera. Your foil is like one pixel. Okay. So the question is, in principle, someone can come up with geometric hoaxes where they can create like ghost objects, as some term used in tomography, okay. which means that the NRF itself is a good, has good material sensitivity, but no sensitivity to, ge to, to geometry. So what we do to make up for that is that we take our weapon, as well as reference, and we rotate it at different angles. We do take multiple projections, and then we compare those projections to each other. And what happens is that essentially you find out that you could in principle come up with a fake, okay? And there is specific mathematical formula which tells you which tells you exactly what the um, what the uh, host needs to do to be able to fake it. Okay? And essentially what it comes down to is that a ghost can be broken down to like the Zernike polynomials with an order that has to be larger than the number of possible projections, which is determined by your angular resolution. So if you have a good angular resolution of say which results in 60 possible projections, 
It has to come up with a hoax that has an order of 60 or more. And this is what it looks like. Okay. So yes, it is possible to do, but it's so hard okay, that making this something so complex is going to be more expensive than the weapon itself. At that point, they might as well make a new weapon or just give up one of their weapons. So hoaxes are possible, but they're completely useless <coughs> in terms of actually gaining something for the, for the host. And you can essentially, for let's say two projections, you can calculate the probability of them actually sneaking through uh, holes, and it's something like a half a percent, which is 99.5 percent of being cool. So we conclude that geometric hoaxes are possible, but are too complex to give any value whatsoever. And finally, in last minute, uh, that I'm done, is something that's important to do whenever you're working with something like this, it's really important to kind of play the devil's advocate and think, how could somebody, you know, cheat my system? How somebody could defeat my system? And there's essentially three possible weaknesses. One of them in soundness, how can someone hoax it? Second one is in completeness, meaning false positives. And finally, the important one is how can you extract some information anyway? So we did this measurement, it seems that nothing can come out, but maybe there is a way to do this. So what we have done is that we have systematically built up a database where we think like list of things that, you know, in principle could be exploited. And we essentially, you know, prioritize them in terms of how important they are, are they truly uh, <coughs> vulnerability or not, and if it's a vulnerability, how we can patch it. Okay. And we have concluded that in principle, you know, there are vulnerabilities, but most of them are patchable. Okay. And, but however, if you want to do this, like, if you want to be at this value, you need to do this rigorously. So we're trying to use mathematical approach and, like, systematic approach to this. And with that, I'm done, and I'm ready for your questions. <coughs> One focus we've had at Livermore uh, you know, it has to do with counterterrorism, counterterrorism, and a lot of equipment was developed for that, as it, as it was.